Well, once again, good morning. It's, a, it's certainly a pleasure and an honor to welcome each and every one of you to our fall assembly as we embark on a brand new academic year and a fall semester. Um, I know I've told you this before, around the middle of August, it always seems to get a little bit lonely around campus. Now, it never gets lonely enough to actually get any work done, okay? But still, um, to see the students arrive back on campus and the, uh, the football team practicing and the band out and move-in day yesterday, you know, there's just, there's a special quality to that that uh, it's hard to define and impossible to replace. I hope that each and every one of you had a summer that was both productive and restorative. Uh, we had family time, and I would like to introduce uh, the lovely First Lady of Texas A&M University Commerce, who is joining us here today, my lovely wife, Jelena. She and Aislinn and I made our annual trek to Galveston to enjoy the beach with family and friends. I was able to schedule some downtime. <laughs> um, and I also, I don't, I don't remember this picture being taken, by the way. But I also worked in a round of golf at uh, there at the Moody Gardens Golf Course on Galveston Island, and I hit the best tee shot of my life. Just look how close I am to the cup here. This was about a 50-yard hole, but still, this is, this is big for me. So I hope that your memories of the summer of 2015 are equally, if not more, pleasant than ours. We begin this semester on a sad note by noting the loss of two members of our Lyon family. Dr. Margot Harbison passed away in July. She retired from the university in 1999 after a long career, first as a faculty member and later as athletic director and head of the Department of Health and Physical Education. She touched the lives of literally thousands of student athletes as well as dozens of coaches and faculty members and is fondly remembered by, men, by many. There will be a memorial service for Dr. Harbison at the Performing Arts Center at 2.30 on September 12th, following the Athletic Hall of Fame induction ceremony and luncheon. We also mourn the passing of Carol Dickinson, a senior buyer in procurement services who had been with the university since 1991. Carol was a friend to all, and her loss was felt deeply by her many friends and coworkers. Today, I extend an especially warm welcome to our new faculty and staff. The days when we could introduce each and every one of you individually are long gone, but nonetheless, could I ask our new faculty and staff to please stand so that we may recognize and welcome you to our university. Thank you for bringing your special gifts and talents to Texas A&M University Commerce. I would like to uh, take a moment and announce two leadership appointments. As many of you know, our athletic director, Ryan Ivey, resigned this summer to take a position at Austin P. University near his family in Tennessee. We have launched a national search for the next AD, which we hope will conclude in the next few weeks. And during this time, Josh Jorgensen will serve as interim AD. So Josh, thank you for stepping up. If you would stand up. We are also pleased to announce that Dr. Yvonne Villanueva Russell will be serving as the new Assistant Dean of the Honors College. Congratulations, Yvonne, on your new role. I know that you'll be very successful. I'm going to call on uh, each of the Vice Presidents in turn to bring you news from their divisions. So uh, we will start with Dr. Mary Hendricks, Vice President for Student Access and Success. Dr. Hendricks. Thank you, President Jones, and good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Sean DeVoe, who is serving as our Interim Dean of Students this fall while we conduct a national search to replace Dean John Coffus. Sean, would you please stand and be recognized? And welcome him. Well, here is the news you've all been waiting for. Where are we as far as enrollment this fall? This will break down the enrollment by college, semester credit hours by college, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels. I promised Interim Dean John Humphreys that I would, I would point out 
that the College of Business undergraduate semester credit hours are actually not down. What actually happened was the BWS degree actually transferred to the College of Science Engineering. So if you add the 2,400 plus hours uh, for the BWS degree, you'll see that the College of Business is indeed in the black. You'll also see the uh, College of Education and Human Services semester credit hours, as well as the School of Agriculture. Bottom line, as of 4 p.m. yesterday afternoon, we were 12,612 headcount here at this university, a record, and it's all because of you, so thank you. This morning's number, for those of you who received the enrollment report, we are already up 12,636. It is likely we could hit 13,000 at this institution. So thanks to all of you for making this possible. I would like to point out that our retention rate has also set a new record. We are at 73% this morning, so congratulations. <laughs> Most of you have heard the struggles that we've had with housing. Uh, for the first time, we're full. The apartments in commerce are full. So the implications for us long term, I think, are far reaching. Yesterday, 1,448 students had moved in. That is 60.6% of the students that we expect to return. Last year, it was 54.8%. Our projected occupancy is 2,390. The challenge for us will be the freshmen who wake up on Monday and think, I need to go to school and have done nothing. <laughs> I'd like to also recognize our residential living and learning staff because they have been dealing with a very difficult situation, so thank you. <laughs> We're very pleased to provide an opportunity for our students that they have been requesting for years, and that is a SEEDS office, serving engaged, empowered, and diverse students. We're dealing with a very different student population today than we had 20 years ago, and many students need a place to go, a place to uh, get together to share experiences. For the first time this fall, we will be opening this office a link is provided here where you'll have more information regarding the activities, but we certainly want to welcome all of you and encourage you to attend the grand opening on September 23rd. We're also very pleased to announce that our TRIO Services uh, Office, under the leadership of Veronica Reed, has received a grant from the U.S. Department of Education 481,656 each year for the next five years to provide support to our students who are low income, first generation, and our students with disabilities. So thank you, Veronica, and your staff. And at this time, I believe Dr. Adolfo Benavides is going to introduce the new tenured faculty. Dr. Hendricks, good morning, and thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here and here to be thrilled. And over the last year, I have been thrilled by the accomplishments of our faculty. I'd like to begin my section of the program by celebrating the accomplishment of tenure of some of our distinguished faculty members. I'd like to ask each of them to stand up and remain standing until uh, I read the last name and then we can all celebrate their accomplishment. All right, here we go. Uh, Dr. Tabitha Atkins, Department of Literature and Languages. Dr. Julia Ballinger, Department of Education Leadership. Dr. Artem Borgemenki, Education Leadership Department, Dr. Sandra Gates, Accounting Department, Dr. Kishore Guru Garana, 
Economics and Finance Department, Dr. Randall Hooper, Music Department, Dr. Beth Jones, Psychology, Counseling and Special Ed Department, Dr. Lacey Kruger, Psychology, Counseling and Special Ed, Dr. William Kurachina, History Department, Dr. Mutlu Mete, Computer Science and Information Systems, Dr. Steven Risen, Psychology, Counseling, Special Ed Department, Dr. Philip Waiko, Sociology and Criminal Justice Department, and Dr. Thomas West, Chemistry. I would also like us to celebrate the promotion to a high rank for the following faculty members. Dr. Pamela Webster, promoted to Associate Professional Track, Mathematics Department. <laughs> promoted to Associate Professor from the Art Department, Mr. Chad Smith. <laughs> promoted to the rank of Full Professor, Dr. Julia Ballinger. Dr. Kishore Guru Garana, Dr. Daryl Harp from the School of Agriculture, Dr. Karen Rogenkamp, Literature and Languages, Dr. Nikolai Serikov, Mathematics and Computer Science Departments, Dr. Tara Tiston Smith, Health and Human Department and Human Performance, and last but not least, Dr. Robert Williams, the School of Agriculture. Faculty, on a personal note, I celebrate your accomplishments with great pride. And I look forward to recognizing the tenure and uh, promoted faculty members in next year's assembly. Also, as you know, we implemented or we launched our QEP, preparing students for an interconnected world. And part of that implementation uh, called for uh, reach the target goal of 50, for this year, 50 faculty and staff members to have attained the designation of Global Fellows. At the end of one semester, and with one semester to go for this year, uh, we have uh, attained uh, 50, no, 36 faculty members have attained such Global Fellows designation. Their names are on the screen. If I may ask each of them to stand up to be recognized. Por favor, los. <laughs> At the end of this assembly, each of you will be presented a certificate and medallion here on off to the main stage. I'd like to outline some of the major agenda items for the Division of Academic Affairs for this academic year. First and foremost, uh, we're going to be transitioning our competency-based Texas Affordable Baccalaureate degree, the Bachelor of Applied Arts and Science in Organizational Leadership, into the College of Education and Human Services. Secondly, we're going to continue with the provost intern position, and this year's provost intern is Dr. Carmen Salazar. She will be tasked with the monumental uh, task of uh, revising and updating our faculty handbook. Additionally, for this year, you know, we have not reached closure on the full-time faculty teaching workload policy this year under the leadership of Dr. Tara Tichten smith who is the chair of the Department Heads Council. That council will be working on uh, presenting a, a draft of the teaching workload policy 
that will incorporate an additional metric, semester credit hours. In addition to that, over this academic year, I will be working with the BRDC, the Budget Review and Development Committee, on drafting a procedure to allocate graduate assistantships and departmental operating budgets, um, not historical budgeting basis, but zero-based budgeting basis. In addition to that, this year we begin the implementation of our new strategic plan, and so we're going to begin uh, measuring baselines in order to be able to assess the extent to which over the next five years we are meeting those goals. Something that will also occupy our academic affairs attention throughout the year is the revision and update of a 45-page document titled, or procedure, titled Academic Freedom, Tenure, Promotion, and Post-Tenure Review. Rest assured that as we draft the revisions, faculty will have the opportunity to present their input in a number of um, scheduled forums. Also, this will be discussed at the Faculty Senate, the Department Chair's Council, and, and so uh, look forward to that review. We believe also in the professional development of our department heads, and we have developed and implemented soon to be implemented a, an onboarding, onboarding course for these uh, department heads. Our Center for Faculty Excellence and Innovation will pursue three major initiatives this year. We're going to be piloting, or that center is going to be piloting, the development and implementation of an e-portfolio approach for the submission of promotion and tenure packets through a software titled Digication. Faculty from each of the four colleges in the School of Agriculture have volunteered to pilot this for this program. The intent is that the new class of faculty who are starting this year will submit their promotion and tenure packet materials electronically when their promotion and tenure time comes. In addition to that, as a system of quality assurance for our online courses, we're going to be adopting the system of quality matters. And last but not least, we're going to be piloting on a more extensive basis the system of monitoring exams in online classes through remote Proctor Now. Finally, please mark on your calendars the date of September 21st of this year and make it a point to join us for the grand opening of the new location of our Center for Faculty Excellence and Innovation. Again, September 21st. Thank you so much. I look forward to having a wonderful year again. And thank you, our faculty and staff, for what you do for this university. Thank you. Now I'd like to call on uh, Vice President for Administration, Alicia Curran, for updates from her division. Good morning and greetings from the Division of Business and Administration. This is actually my first time as your Vice President to be in front of you at, at the Fall Assembly, so I feel very honored and blessed to be here. Um, we've had a busy summer spring, fall in our division, starting with the legislative session. As the slide says, it was a good legislative session for higher education, but not so good for public two-year institutions or for public schools. 
We started the session with a new governor, a new lieutenant governor, a new Senate education chair, and new appropriations and Senate finance chair, so we weren't real sure how we would end up. But the lawmakers made a firm commitment to higher education. The 84th legislature increased funding for financial aid programs by $91 million and increased formula funding, which is our largest source of revenue for public colleges and universities by 9%. The increase in formula funding for A&M Commerce was totally driven by increases in enrollment and was used to fund our merit pool for fiscal year 2016. The legislature also phased out the Texas Beyond Time Loan Program except for renewals and added additional restrictions related to procurement with Senate Bill 20 and passed Senate Bill 11 related to campus carry. And after many attempts, there was no relief for the Hazelwood Tuition Program at the end of the session. The legislature authorized $3.1 billion in capital construction projects, TRBs, the first since 2006, and added $131 million to the state's higher education or HEAF fund. And as you can see, we were a big winner in this area. A large portion of these new HEAF funds will be used as a method of financing for the new nursing and health sciences building. Many institutions received funding for requested exceptional items and we were very fortunate to have our Institute for Competency-Based Education funded. A task force will soon be appointed to plan how we will spend these funds within the intent of the legislative approval. In facilities, SSC has been very busy this spring and summer, but the shutdown of the campus's main chiller created the biggest challenge. <laughs> I was trying to think of something you could, you could clap for in our division, and I think this room is very cool, <laughs> and so I think we should clap for that. That created, cre created cooling issues across several buildings on campus, and no, I am not the person to call if you were too hot in your office. <laughs> but with the main chiller off, temporary chillers were brought in, and those chillers left the campus left fr last Friday. And the outage that occurred yesterday was a totally different issue. So no, we don't need to bring those back. The summer projects are moving along and most have been completed, including several projects in housing, a new parking lot south of the Rayburn Student Center, repaving of the existing parking lot by the new softball field. And over the next few weeks, you will notice some tree trimming on campus and the ongoing BA chiller replacement, which is a totally different chiller. The horse barn has been completed and is already full. I hear they already need, a, need another one. We have new parking signs and various moves and renovations around campus. And yes, the street project is now complete. <laughs> Over the next few years, we will have several major projects on campus, most of which are currently in the planning stage. We have received the timeline for the new nursing and health sciences building. The RFQ will be released in September with responses due in October. There will be some redesign construction documents, board of regents approvals, et cetera. And then construction will actually begin, or is planned to begin in May of 2017 with completion by March of 2019. It is going to be a phenomenal building. We are in the first group receiving our approvals to begin the construction with the A&M system, so we are ahead of the game with most institutions. A vendor has been selected for the multi-activity court, and this project is also currently under development. And then the Northern Addition Weight and Cardio Remodel Project for the Morris Rec Center will, will begin in fiscal year 2018 and it will be funded through the increase in the student recreational fee that was previously approved by the students for this coming fall. We are also in the planning process for our new freshman residence hall, which will be our first P3 project and will be built where the tennis courts currently exist. And P3 stands for Public Private Partnership. We will still operate this facility just like the others, but we will use a different construction and financing process. We have selected a system approved vendor and should begin construction next spring with occupancy in August of 2017. 
And as Dr. Hendricks just mentioned, with our increase, it can't come quickly enough. So that one will be important. The tennis courts will be relocated across the highway. The university purchased three properties adjacent to campus and they are currently in the process of being demolished. You may have noticed the demolition of the Humpfeld House occurred this week. For those of you who live in Commerce or are from Commerce, this house has been here forever and we all remember the Christmas decorations on the roof every year. So it's kind of like a, a monument in Commerce. We appointed a committee to make suggestions for the development of that area and they have provided their report to PAC so that's in process. The athletic weight room renovation is complete and includes a new rubber floor over an additional, uh, additional six to eight inches of concrete poured to reinforce the floor during workouts. I can remember going over there and seeing that floor jiggle when they would, the weight, so this is very good. Along with the flooring, they have new fluorescent lighting and the department overhauled or purchased new weight equipment. It is also a fantastic area. The legislature also passed Senate Bill 11, also known as Campus Carry, and Chief Spinato would, would remind me to say Campus Concealed Carry, which goes into effect on August 1st of 2016. We have approximately one year to prepare for this new legislation. The president plans to appoint a task force, um, and he has asked Sharon Johnson and I to serve as co-chairs. This will be a large group of individuals representing all of the constituencies on campus and you will all have an opportunity to be engaged. Our ultimate goal will be to follow the legislative intent of the law while maintaining the well-being and safety of everyone on our campuses. Thank you very much. And we will complete the VP Roundup with a report from Randy Van Dieven, Vice President for Institutional Advancement. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I want to thank you for inviting me back uh, on stage. It's been, what, like three years since you went out on a limb like this to get an engineer up here to talk to such a group. So, uh, and I totally get it. He's back here saying, watch it. So. Um, <laughs> The next two or three minutes will determine whether I ever get another chance to be up here. So here it goes. <clears throat> $2,044,000. Yes, that's $8,000 more than is what, what is on the screen. Because you see, Dr. Jones, we raise money while you are sleeping. <laughs> Just as student access continues to recruit, the business office is processing payments and the provost office is assembling its faculty to welcome the students to campus. We all work while you sleep. And many of those dedicated employees are right here in our audience. $2,044,000, a record high for this institution and an indication of better times to come. Additionally, the foundation offered over $1 million in scholarships for the academic year 2014-2015. Another all-time high. A big congratulations to Mr. Jared Knight, KETR station manager, for his election to non-commercial seat on board of directors for Texas Association of Broadcasters. And oh, by the way, KETR is well on its way to set another all-time high in raising private funds. <clears throat> Now for the newcomers, I see there was quite a few newcomers out here. I, I don't want to creep you out, in it, but our fa founding father is buried on this campus and uh, we call that the Mayo Gravesite. And it needs a little TLC, so we're doing a little fundraising uh, to the tune of about $100,000 uh, when we get that identified for, for making that a little bit more appealing. So, uh, and if those of you are not aware where it's at, it's on the northeast side of campus over here. The Brick Garden, an alumni relations project. You have until Monday, August 31st, for phase one to get your name on a brick. Who doesn't want their name on a brick, right? I mean, that's your stardom. <clears throat> and the Lucky's Thank You celebration. Many of you attended the Royal Roar. Well, the Royal Roar is our, our, our celebration of recognition. This is our celebration of appreciation, where we're bringing donors and students together for a chance to express their gratitude to alumni and friends who truly care. Bridge builders, we could not have attained the numbers that I reported without your help. 
The fact that we can tell our alumni that our faculty and staff are committed in helping students sets the tone and makes a tremendous difference. No matter the amount, no matter the amount one gives, what matters is that we give because we care. Now a little history lesson. John Wayne was not the father of the Flying Tigers, as depicted in the 1942 classic movie, The Flying Tigers. I can tell there's not many people my age that even remember that movie, I guess. So anyway, that distinction goes to General, or Lieutenant General Claire Chennault. His expertise in pursuit aviation training of the Air, Chinese Air Force literally saved a country in distress from Japanese invasion. This guy is considered a true hero in China. Well, it turns out Claire Chenault was born in Commerce, Texas. Yes, on Monroe Street, one block north of Live Oak. A little history lesson there. The university is teeming with the city of Commerce in the chamber, chamber in placing a marker inscribed in Mandarin Chinese at the site, the first historical marker written in a foreign language. <clears throat> Chancellor Sharp, who was in the Corps at A&M and a member of the Flying Tiger Squadron, will be celebrating with us. We ask you save the date, October 14th, sometime around mid-morning is when the celebration will start. Lastly, steel branding. Many of us in this auditorium are well aware of the need to do something about our website. We are blessed to have hired the services of a professional communications firm expert in branding, marketing, advertising, public relations, and digital targeting. Their expertise combined with the talent we already have in a small shop but effective shop, we are excited about moving forward. This is a very tedious task which is going to take some time, so we ask for your patience and cooperation when called upon. Uh, I have one employee, uh, well, uh, an interim employee that many of you have had the pleasure of meeting, and she was very instrumental in helping us getting the, the steel branding on board and, and, and holding down the fort while Miss Lisa Martinez was off uh, having a, a baby. Uh, her name's Diana Harrell, and I would like for her to stand up if she's in the audience. <laughs> That's how darn good of an employee she is. Anyway, she'll appreciate that we at least uh, uh, recognized her here. So, Thank you, Diana. And thank you for what you do for this university. And please know our office is a resource you can call upon to help you with your fund fundraising initiatives. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I hope I didn't embarrass you too much right here. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Okay, quick show of hands. Does Randy get to come back on the podium next year? All right, congratulations, Randy. I think it's a majority. I have a few more quick announcements I'd like to make before I share with you uh, some thoughts on the big directions I think that our university is headed in in the next uh, uh, few years. Throughout the past year, I've been uh, bringing you regular progress reports on the development of our 2015-2020 strategic plan. And I think most, if not all of you, uh, now know that the final draft has been submitted to the Chancellor for his review. Pending his approval, I will appoint a standing strategic plan assessment committee, and we will begin implementation. Uh, this is a live action plan. It doesn't just go on the shelf. There are specific goals and objectives and uh, metrics for measuring our progress. We're not going to go over it today, uh, but once it is approved, it will be posted on the website and we will be getting to work. I'm also pleased to announce that beginning this year, we are in a position to fund the Lion Family Scholarship, which will benefit family members of faculty and staff. Thanks go to the Faculty Senate, uh, especially the last two presidents, Dr. Linda Openshaw and Dr. Stephen Starnes for working with me and PAC uh, and, and the whole crew to, uh, to get this program established. I think this is a wonderful new benefit for our employees. Why not? Those who are clapping are those who have children who will soon be going off to college. So you needed to identify them. 
During the coming year, we will be conducting a living, learning, and working assessment, essentially a campus climate survey with a particular focus on diversity. Some of you have already been involved in this effort through your membership in the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force or through your participation in a focus group or information session. This comprehensive survey will help us establish benchmarks, set goals, and devise strategies to achieve the objectives of the strategic plan. And I would like to uh, express my gratitude and the gratitude of the entire university to Dr. Edward Romero for his leadership in uh, getting this initiative off the ground. Thank you, Edward. I am also very pleased to announce the formation of the Staff Council, the first one in the university's history. Special thanks go to last year's leadership cohort for developing the concept and establishing guidelines for the formation of the Staff Council. Thanks and congratulations as well go to Tina Boytnot, the Council's founding chair. Is Tina here today? She must be at her desk too. So uh, she uh, is planning a great year of activities. There will be an ice cream social, mark your calendar, uh, September 23rd at the Alumni Center from 3 to 4.30. So if you're around that afternoon, please plan to drop by. Also coming this fall, the President's Book Club. Uh, I'm not going to be leading every program, but I thought, well, why not? Let's just call it the President's Book Club to get it started. Uh, Dr. Salvatore Attardo was actually the prime mover in getting this, uh, the book club uh, up and running, and I, I appreciate not just his encouragement, but his, his uh, ceaseless pestering and hounding on this to, to, get, this, uh, to get this running. Uh, books selected for review will focus on issues in higher education and professional growth with the goal of nurturing the development of our university's emerging leaders, and we'll be providing additional details as we get into the fall semester. Well, as we begin the fall semester, we near the end of the year-long celebration of the 125th anniversary of our founding. As I noted when we gathered here a year ago, last fall, September 2nd, 1889 was the date upon which the 28-year-old William Leonidas Mayo, Professor Mayo, first opened the doors to East Texas Normal College in the tiny town of Cooper, Texas. I have often recounted for you the story of those early years of East Texas Normal College, for I find in them a source of inspiration, vision, and faith in the future of this great university. I've shared with you the history of how the original college building burned to the ground in 1894, prompting the move to Commerce. You know as well the stories of two more devastating fires at the Commerce campus, neither of which daunted Professor Mayo from the pursuit of his dream. Like a phoenix, East Texas Normal kept rising from the ashes, each time coming back bigger, better, and more sharply focused on the future than ever before. Certainly within the last 125 years, the university has withstood many challenges. But more importantly, we have achieved many, many triumphs. This fall at our homecoming football game on October 24th, we will officially conclude our year of celebration with a new tradition and a special recognition of our entering freshman class, our 126th. The game begins at 4 p.m., so please plan to come and be a part of this special moment in our university's history. As our 125th anniversary celebration comes to a close, we observe three other important university milestones. The 40th anniversary of the founding of KETR, our NPR radio station. The 100th anniversary of the publication of the East Texan. And 100 seasons of Lion Athletics. We celebrated the founding of KETR in 1975 last spring with a birthday bash on the Great Lawn. You can continue the celebration this fall by supporting your station during the fall pledge drive September 28th through October 25th. Just go to KETR.org and click donate. And let me tell you, if you are slow in fulfilling your pledge, you'll get a phone call or an email, as I did, from Jared Knight. So they, are, uh, they mean it, okay? They are persistent and they are uh, goal-oriented. 
There are very few copies of early editions of the East Texan, and we are fortunate indeed this spring to have received the gift of this original issue from that first year of publication. It's now in our archives. This is number nine, volume one of the East Texan, dated December 18, 1915. The front page of that edition is given over to a leisurely consideration of the definition of a classic in modern life, hard-hitting investigative journalism. There is also a prominently placed, placed advertisement for the Rexall drugstore. Many thanks to our friend Kenny Bishop, who found this issue at the bottom of a box of miscellaneous items he had picked up from an estate sale, uh, and this was clearly the most uh, precious uh, item in the box. He then donated it to our library. And here's a photograph, this one from 1925 of the East Texan staff taken in the press room of the Commerce Journal. I am uh, pleased to announce that the last one of these staffers will be graduating this December. So. <laughs> I know that uh, Fred Stewart and Lamar Bridges have some uh, fun and special activities planned uh, to mark this centennial, so please be watching for these. Also this year, we will be celebrating 100 seasons of Lion Athletics. Some of you may know the story of the first football team at East Texas Normal, which took the field in 1915. I've shared this with you before. Professor Mayo had a long-standing objection to collegiate football, which he considered brutish, unrefined, and dangerous. But his son, Marion Doc Mayo, this fine-looking young lad, um, and his wife, Etta, desperately wanted to start a program. Uh, Etta's advice to Doc was, you all just practice off campus until your father comes around. Well, um, his father did come around at Mrs. Mayo's urging, and the football team played three games in its first season. The highlight of that first season was a tie with Southern Methodist University. Now, this sounds big, but SMU was also in its first season, and later that season, SMU lost a game to Rice by a score of 147 to zero. <laughs> so, it's not quite the powerhouse that it later became. Uh, despite this inauspicious start, football at East Texas was here to stay, playing first as the East Texas Normal Lights. Isn't that wonderful? Until 1919, when the team officially became the Lions. The Athletics Department is planning a year-long series of activities commemorating the many important milestones in the first 100 years of Lion Athletics. So please plan on being part of this year-long celebration. It all starts next Thursday evening with our home football opener against Adams State. Tailgating begins at 4, so plan on coming early to cheer the Lions on to victory. As we celebrate these milestones, we find in them the prelude to a future of unparalleled opportunity. Our destiny is at hand. There is no doubt in my mind that our university is entering a period of unparalleled advancement. If you need evidence of this, take a look at the students we will be greeting in a few minutes during the annual Pride Walk. Members of the largest freshman class as well as the largest student body in history. You may not have noticed it yet, but this campus is becoming a very, very busy place. Dr. Hendricks gave you the specific numbers earlier, 12,636 as of 8 o'clock, uh, probably 1276 by now. Uh, our one-stop shop is open evenings this week as well as this Saturday to accommodate our students' busy lives and to make good on our commitment that every qualified student will have an opportunity to enroll. Keeping this commitment hasn't been easy. A hearty thanks goes out to all the recruiters, admissions counselors, financial aid advisors, and all the other members of Dean Sosa's enrollment management team for their tireless and cheerful service to students. Thanks go as well to deans and department heads for monitoring enrollments hour by hour, even minute by minute during this busy time adjusting caps, splitting and adding sections, scrambling to find qualified instructors. And of course, thanks go as well to the faculty for accepting those additional students into already full sections and for taking on overloads. This is hard work, 
but we owe our students nothing less. Adding and staffing a new section, a new session, a new section, I'm sorry, is a struggle. But for a student, getting a seat in that section marks the beginning of a journey of educational transformation that will lead to a future of unimaginable transformation and opportunity. As difficult as it is to find a seat for that student, finding a bed for him or her can be next to impossible. And again, Dr. Hendricks uh, gave you the numbers on this earlier. But for the first time ever, our residence halls are full with waiting lists. Uh, the people in Res Life are doing incredible juggling acts, uh, taking those uh, phone calls from concerned parents who, uh, well, we won't tell you what they say when they call, but um, they're calling. Uh, we are well into planning our next residence hall. It can't get here soon enough. And as she also reported, the city of Commerce is pretty well full up as well. Those of you who have been here a long time cannot recall when this has ever occurred before. The Walmart parking lot is pretty full as well. I would suggest that you go early, uh, avoid it all together on Sunday. Um, small refrigerators, big screen TVs, and ramen noodles are all in short supply. <laughs> this student who moved into Pride Rock yesterday, I believe, got the very last two cases of ramen noodles. So they're on back order. Not only are our students growing in number, they are increasing in quality. This fall, students admitted to our Honors College are, on average, in the top 4.56% of their high school graduating class. That is phenomenal. <laughs> the addition of the Regent Scholars Program a few years ago has helped us attract even more highly qualified students. And as you know, our Regent Scholars go through the same application and admissions process that our Honors College students go through. Overall, almost 12% of our student body ranks in the top 10% of their graduating class. And this very important number, which we have to report to the state and which is tracked, is a key performance indicator. It continues to rise each and every year, a sure sign of the growing quality of our student body. Another measure of the quality of our students is the fall-to-fall -fall retention rate. Dr. Hendricks, again, gave you the specifics on this earlier in the hour, but this continues to rise. We are uh, approaching 74%. This is almost six points ahead of where we were last year at this time. Again, this is a figure we track, report, and increasingly this will be tied to funding. So, so important that we help our students succeed, and you all are doing just that. We're also seeing a striking reduction of quality in the substantial reduction in the number of students requiring developmental education. I was pleased to uh, present this slide to the uh, Board of Regents about two and a half weeks ago because, again, this is something that they track. Three years ago, we made data-driven decisions to reset the placement scores uh, for our developmental courses, and since then, the number requiring remediation has plunged from more than 13% to less than 2% in 2014. Now, it sounds like we just lowered standards, but in fact, and more importantly, these students are showing improved success rates in their college level university studies courses, especially math. So it turned out to be a very wise move indeed, and thank you all for making it work. Another important mark of quality, a significant improvement in our six-year graduation rate which increased from 46% to 53%, seven full points from 2000 to 2014. We are achieving these impressive outcomes with a student body that has never been more diverse. Since 2000, the African American student population has grown by nearly 25%, from about 15% of our student body overall to nearly 20%, slightly over. Hispanic student enrollment has nearly tripled in that time, from a little over 5% to now nearly 16%. Reflective of broader demographic trends, our white student population has declined as a percentage of total enrollment, while our Asian and international student populations have grown, as has that most rapidly growing demographic segment of all, other. <laughs> you can check it off. 
Programs such as the Office of Hispanic Outreach and the African American Male Mentoring Initiative are making a difference. The six-year graduation rate of our African American students, as you see in the box that's highlighted down here in the lower right-hand corner of this chart, now leads the state average by more than seven percentage points. So not only are we attracting more African American students, they are succeeding at rates surpassing not only the rates of our general student body, but the average throughout the state. Very, very significant. <clears throat> so our students are being successful. Equally, if not more important, so are our alumni. In the last 125 years, we have graduated many, many generations of teachers who have gone on to transform the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Texas students. It is still a foundational element of our mission. When I speak to incoming freshmen, I remind them that if they attended a public school virtually anywhere in the state of Texas, their lives have already been touched by this university in the form of a great teacher, a coach, a counselor, or a principal or a superintendent who received his or her education at this university. We remain one of the state's top producers of highly qualified teachers in all fields and at all levels. But even more impressive, we rank third in the state in the production of critically needed teachers in STEM fields, behind only Texas A&M and the University of Texas El Paso, and well ahead of many institutions that are substantially larger. So this is a tremendous achievement. Look how far down the University of North Texas is. Just, <laughs> just saying, okay? We're also a leader in producing uh, uh, leaders in higher education. At last count, we have 35 alumni currently serving as presidents or chancellors of American colleges and universities. The most recent to be named is Dr. Beverly McClure, the first woman president of Adams State University, whom we will be beating in football a week from today. Uh, I did, in fact, invite her to come to the game, but she had a, uh, a scheduling conflict, so unfortunately we'll have to miss uh, what for her will be a humbling event. <laughs> as proud as we are of our alumni who become teachers, we are equally proud of our alumni in other fields. Alumni such as Dr. Bob Galvan, the first Hispanic student to receive bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from East Texas State University. Dr. Galvan went on to serve in executive leadership positions at the University of Texas at Austin. He was an advisor to the U.S. Department of Education and the State Department. Embassies in Central America sought him out for advice and counsel. He remains engaged with his alma mater as a generous donor and advisor to Lion Athletics. James Thrower, class of 1970, was a three-sport athlete at ETSU and went on to play for the Detroit Lions. He is now one of McDonald's largest minority franchise owners and has served in numerous positions of corporate and civic leadership in his adopted hometown of Detroit, Michigan. Two years ago, he gave the lead gift that led to the establishment of the James Thrower Athletic Academic Support Center. Dr. Leonard Merrill also earned bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from ETSU, beginning his career at Commerce Middle School as a teacher and a coach. He advanced to lead the Katy Independent School District, one of the state's fastest growing, as superintendent, and in 1998 was named the Texas Association of School Administra Administrators Superintendent of the Year. Last spring, he was inducted as a distinguished alumnus of Texas A&M University Commerce. Carl Ritchie, class of 1981, served as Deputy Chief of Staff for Governor Ann Richards. He chairs the Board of Commissioners for the Housing Authority of the City of Austin, and in October will become President of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. I could go on and on, and I'm sure that many of you have names that you would like to add to the list as well. Successful graduates with whom you have remained in contact and whose successful careers you have followed. We can all be justly proud of the fact that we have touched the lives of many thousands of individuals whose success 
has in turn translated into better lives for many, many thousands more. As we embark on our 126th year, let us reflect for a moment on the reasons behind the many great things that are happening at our university. Our robust growth is not a blip or an anomaly. The ever-improving academic qualifications of our students, not an accident. The extraordinary success of our graduates, not simply a coincidence. There is indeed something special about this place. As we leave today to go about the business of getting a new semester underway, I'd like to ask each of you to consider what makes it special for you. Each of us came to this university for a reason. None of us is here by chance. Once we arrived, we, sound, we found something meaningful that made us want to stay. For me, it is because we are an institution that cares about people. The faculty and staff who comprise our university, the students who give it life, and the alumni whose stories of lives transformed by educational opportunity compel us to ever higher achievement. We call ourselves the university that cares, and caring can take many forms, it can mean many things. It can mean returning phone calls promptly and courteously, even at the busiest of times. It can mean processing paperwork accurately and efficiently. It can mean scheduling tutorial sessions at times and places that are convenient to students, such as evenings and uh, at places like the field house and the residence halls. This kind of caring can be measured, and it is. It's part of our institutional effectiveness plan. But on a more fundamental level, caring is a deeply human impulse, one that flows forth from the sense of community that binds us together in common purpose toward the pursuit of a shared vision of excellence. We care about our colleagues. We care about our students and their families because we care about this institution and we want it to flourish. We care about this institution because we ourselves want to be part of something incredible, something that each day makes the world a better place, one life at a time. I'd like to close today by sharing an email that Dr. Benavides recently received from a student in his Organizational Leadership 231 class. This is the class that he teaches as part of our Texas Affordable Baccalaureate program. Many of you know what that is for our newcomers. Uh, it's a 100% online program that awards credit based on competencies rather than seat time. What this means is that students need not be physically present either to enroll or to receive instruction or to receive credit. In fact, they don't even need to be on dry land. This student's name is Leah Emerson, and this is her story. Hello, Adolfo. How are you? Notice how informal students are getting with their faculty these days. Hello, Adolfo. Thanks for the email and asking about us. I am currently living in Australia, working with a nonprofit organization as a full-time volunteer. It's not your typical job, but I love it. I spend a lot of my time traveling around and I'm never in one place for long. Our focus as an organization is with the, na uh, the nation of Papua New Guinea, where we run a medical ship into some of the most remote places of the country. I oversee a few different areas like registrar, cafe, and mapping. I'm all over the place. I love what I do and I'm excited to see what my future holds. One day I would like to rejoin the workforce and focus on nonprofits in water sustainability. I'm originally from Paris, Texas, not far from commerce. So I come home occasionally to visit family. This program has served my out-of-the-box lifestyle well, and I am excited to get on with things with my degree. Cheers, Leah. Well, that, fellow Lions, is what we are all about, changing lives for the better and thereby, thereby transforming the future for all by extending the warm hand of educational opportunity to deserving students from all walks of life and in all corners of the globe.
Leah Emerson, born and raised in Paris, Texas, is making the world a better place. Imagine how far she will go with a degree from Texas A&M University Commerce. Well, we have a busy semester ahead of us. As you leave today, please pick up a copy of the College of Humanities, Social Sciences, and Arts season poster, which uh, has become a tradition at the Fall Assembly. And after that, I would like to introduce to you the members of the largest freshman class in history. In just a few moments, they will be proceeding down the sidewalk just outside of this building for their formal induction into the Lion class of 2019. We'd like to ask you to line up in two lines uh, on the north side of the sidewalk and also down the middle along where the light poles run. So please join me outside in cheering them on. Thank you once again for sharing these moments together this morning, and I wish you an extraordinarily successful, productive, and rewarding academic year.